Well, last time I looked, I was unmuted. All right, here we go again. So welcome again and again. Uh, thanks for joining us for another great POG Poetry Evening. Uh, I'm Tenny Nathanson, member of POG's Board of Directors and tonight's MC. So it's a delight to welcome POG multi-time recidivist Beverly Dolan back to read for us tonight and wonderful to welcome Martine Bellin for her first POG reading. And acknowledging our peculiar contemporary space time, we offer thanks and proleptic propitiations to the gods of Zoom. May they be with us. Before I turn things over to fellow board member Charles Alexander, who will introduce each of our readers, here are a few acknowledgements and announcements. So first, Pog would like to thank the following organizations and groups for their support, especially for grants again this year that are absolutely essential to our programming, the Arizona Commission on the Arts and the wonderful poets and writers. And also for consistent support over the years, the University of Arizona Poetry Center, University of Arizona English Department, the journal Arizona Quarterly, which is housed in the English Department, and uh, Tucson's Gem Chax Press. Big thanks also to our many individual patrons and sponsors for the generous contributions. We definitely wouldn't be able to offer these readings without you. And if you're here tonight and you're interested in joining our roster of supporting donors, please visit our website, which is uh, pogartstucson.org. We'll try to put that in the chat later, but one word, pogartstucson.org. And there you should be able to find a pledge form to, be a, to become a patron for the year for $100 or a sponsor for $50 or to pledge any other amount. Uh, when you registered, I think this is still working correctly, you should have received a follow-up email uh, inviting you to make a donation for tonight's reading. Uh, if you're able to do it and feel like it, the suggested donation is $5 or if you're a student, and we used to say starving artists, so why not uh, $3? But uh, if you can do that, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, as as uh, Charles mentioned, November's reading uh, will be uh, Tucson's Tony Luberman and Jonathan Stalling, who's uh, another reader that we've invited uh, back and hadn't, hasn't read for us in, in a while. You can go to our website also to see uh, more schedule of upcoming readings and to register for those once they're up there on the registration page so that you can uh, attend the Zoom readings. And as Charles mentioned, we're a mix of Zoom and, and live th this year. Uh, POG is committed to being an inclusive, supporting, and safe space for everyone. While it's somewhat less likely on Zoom, uh, if something happens that you feel uncomfortable about, please reach out to one of our directors. So first, if you're on the board of directors, if you raise your hand, that'd be great. And I was thinking maybe um, if we have a moment uh, to do it quickly before Charles uh, turns off the chat during the reading, if you're a director, if you feel like throwing your email address or your cell phone uh, into the chat so that people can reach out to you if they're uh, so inclined, that would be, be great. Uh, and as I said, once the uh, reading starts, we'll uh, turn the chat off, but we'll open it up again right after the reading's over. Also, POG would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home. Tucson, where POG is based, is the ancestral home of the Tonawatam and Pascoyaki nations. Please take a moment to reflect on how, in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So uh, before I turn things over to Charles, just l let me uh, give everybody a heads up that it's our custom to have an informal conversation after the reading. Uh, we've been doing that on Zoom the same way we do live and usually runs about 15 minutes, give or take. And uh, you know, feel free to, to stay for that. We hope you will, but uh, if you're not able to, that's, that's great too. So again, welcome. It's great to have everybody here and I'll turn things over to Charles. Okay, I think, I guess I am unmuted. <laughs> I don't have to unmute myself. Um, and. And to add to that, uh, you will all have the ability to unmute yourself for that conversation at the end. Okay. Uh, it is a delight to welcome tonight first uh, Martine Bellin, who is the author of nine poetry collections, including Ghosts, The Vulnerability of Order, Tales of Murasaki, and Other Poems, uh, Amazing Cage of Light, New and Selected Poems. Moon in the Mirror, a monodrama. And uh, as I was looking at Martine's um, just information 
and website. One thing that I was both surprised and delighted for is that so many of the people who have written about her books and blurbs and other things have also been people who have been past participants in this series. So I just wanted to read a few of those in, in, in a way in lieu of an introduction. First, Jackson McClough, who said, Martine Bellin is a poet of refreshing complexity, her unpredictable disjunctions and conjunctions, and her Baroque mix of vivid images and meticulous abstractions make one uncertain. Excuse me, I just lost my place because I also have the job of admitting people tonight. <laughs> uh, um, make one uncertain whether these poems in verse composed of prose segments are precise narrations of the contingent or of dreams or of the former masquerading as the latter. They are full of surprises. Also from um, Elizabeth Robinson, who is a friend of many people here, I think, as well as a presenter for POG in the past, Martin Bellin begins uh, one of her books by confessing, I left my permission slip in a past dream and can't remember the pocket it's in. Her curiosity proceeds fleetly, alighting in unbridled freedom on whatever it encounters, whether movies, mothers, cats, or, or, or herms, her, hems, excuse me. These poems are capable of the most agile swerves demonstrating that a serious inquiry can sail on music and play through myth and dream. Here are the malleable, chewy realms of metamorphosis. What joy to discover poetry pushing forward with curiosity and back against delusion. This is, unexpectedly, wisdom literature. Unexpected because Belen creates an uncanny overlap between spirit, inquiry, and human absurdity as she takes us into a charged, changing circus of beyonds. And I think at this point, I will just turn it over to Martine herself. And please welcome Martine Belen. Um, thank you so much, Charles. And thank you to everyone who is responsible for the POG poetry series and other POG events. And um, I'm very, very pleased to be reading here. And uh, I've, I've uh, greatly admire the people who have read in this series. And uh, um, the, 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 uh, the words that you just read from Elizabeth Robinson were specifically uh, about this book that I'm going to be mostly reading from, which is uh, An Anatomy of Curiosity and it's forthcoming. Uh, it'll be published in February. Um, uh, Mad Hat Press is bringing it out. And ironically, the first blurb, the Jackson McClough blurb was from my very first book, Places People Dare Not Enter. So that was a really nice uh, two pieces of uh, del delicious, bread <laughs> for the sandwich, the first and the most recent. So that's, that was very uh, fortuitous. Okay. Um, so uh, I'd like to start with a poem uh, called, it's called The Late Show. Um, I'll just say, uh, uh, actually, let me just quickly say that an anatomy of curiosity um, it, it investigates story in many different forms. It, through dreams, through films, and questions within the story. Who is the teller? What is the tale? And who are the tellers? And is the tale telling the teller, or the teller telling the tale, or all both together, looking at one another? Um, and the book primarily takes place at night, near dream, near that place where language kind of dissipates and falls into another state. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is called The Late Show. The Marquis flashes Ingmar Bergman's persona and I take my velvet seat. 
As audience, one blends into viral characters. B.B. Anderson has been our doctor, a gambler, an insomniac, and now we are a nurse, patient. I brought the 3D glasses home to toss after the show ended in my mind, but the story seems never to end, streaming media. I am in contagion, outbreak, last man on earth, the Omega man, I am legend, a star, all of them me, a lone survivor of a global pandemic, prisoner in one's home, one's mind. Though one might ask, what is mind? One knows the movie is action-based, filled with bad actors talking to parts of themselves, taking parts. That is mind too. The actors believe what will happen is scripted. I am catching actors and sneezing them out. My mind, my mind is housed in the theater, as are the actors, while the theater is not part of a multiplex narrative. I am in midsummer in Sweden, in New York. Involuntarily, I look up and see the intertitles. Seven years earlier, I am in clear and present danger. One cannot be certain which direction time is moving. One cannot be certain of one's location. One must regard setting and wardrobe to identify one's movie and role. The camera's lens is wide angle and in 2020, wide angle lenses have the capability to include everything at once, though there is distortion, feelings. One's body is always in the 500,000 movies that have been developed, new ones in production. The actor sleeps in war paint. One might touch the prosthetic jaw that creates age jowls. One might touch the downy fuzz on one's head and hear the squeal of a baby. Sometimes, One's mind tricks one into believing one can break into another shots. The mind is never in a shot. The mind leads one to the popcorn line, to a concession stand that sells bottomless pop. Mostly one's non-mind believes the camera is focused on one's scene at all times in some surprising angle of which one isn't aware until one is not viable, until one's mind leaves the theater, dismantles the projector, disseminates with light. Um, poem I'll read now is it's titled Hungry Ghost in an Udon Eatery. And it was inspired by an image from Anthony Bourdain's Hungry Ghost manga, and also by a conversation that uh, Gary Snyder and Wang Ping had when they were discussing poetry and other things, not really just poetry, but poetry in the larger sense. Um, Hungry Ghost in an Udon Eatery. Werewolf howls at the awakening wolf moon, rippling and responsive in an eyeball-sized sea. Hirsute, hungry, chewy, silky noodle ghost as witness, waitress, watering mouth or well, salivating stimulus, a dumbbraided dreamer. If Hungry Ghost is not her suit mountain man in the empty sky with an empty stomach grumbling over the aroma of dashi bone broth ocean and the udon chef breath of the cook for constellations, Sirius and Canis major with no apostat, the starving seven sisters of Pallades, not the witches of burning forests and weeping bears and a teeny barred owl. 
traversing the universe as a fable of this mind, our Udon Shake Shack mind. There's an arachne crafting us dinner. We are the shellfish, the meat fat, the wolf look of the bone soup, seeing the hungry diner. Is the diner eating the deer or the, ear, or the deer eating dinner? Hungry ghost ear is hearing the cook avoiding an uncomfortable conversation by slipping out of language off the tongue of spitting waves into primordial soupy matter, drained sand from dilating tidal force currents, devoured by ferocious nocturnal devotion. So now I'm going to read a, a poem, it's called Night Music, and a couple of things about the poem. Uh, the central character in the poem is Little Red Riding Hood, um, but it's red, R-E-A-D, and writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G. And uh, this poem is, um, this poem uh, came from uh, a painting by Dorothea Tanning, which uh, Ina Kleine Nacht Music, I should have spoken, I should have spoken to Alma before. I have a couple of German words throughout these poems. I should have I should have called you and made sure that my pronunciation was correct. I did okay. Very good. And if you're familiar with the painting, um, it's uh, two girls in a in a hall with lots of doors and a long red runner and um, a sunflower. And one girl's hair is all the way going straight up. Um, oh, and this poem is, uh, is uh, explores writing neighbors. Uh, and so Dorothea Tanning is one of the neighbors and the other neighbors are Christ Christina Rossetti and Emily Dickinson and Barbara Guest. Um, so you might not hear the neighbors knocking on the floor, but they're there. Night music. The door jam we peep through, seep through. There, the corridor adorned with a bloody runner. We hear her tiptoe through hells, teeth bearing halls, pull out the tongue, de crescendo. Little red riding hood takes off her ears and slips under a book cover. So amazed is she to see how granny appears in nightwear. On a hanger hung her hood, and on a hook her head. Strangled utterance, all the better to hug you with, my dear. Our ear against the pillowed well. Cheeks, heartless red. One stroke two, we are dead. Though death it could not be, for she stood up and walked among the fiends. Once upon a night, she landed on an airstrip, whoosh, snaking tongue round her throat, suffocating sound, ding dong down that endless chase, doors, of course, wood locked, though one ajar. Through blighted light, helical vortex. Poor little writing hood knows the perils of speaking to hobgoblins who populate her sleep while in her throat she chokes on sticky ghee. Upon the transfer of that song, wicked wolf took the shortest dream to granny's unthatched home, arrived by the time she closed her lids. It was a rural Gothic, all shades assembled, Nine windows, no doors. Enter through the dome home, dripped out the mouth hole. Our ear against an icicled stream, dangling earring, a hum, secret mirror missive. She is afraid to own a body 
it possesses the darkly night. Her marble feet freeze, haunting form, voices vaunt. Between the hour of life and death, next door neighbors knock on the floor. She is afraid to own a soul. Someone else should keep it, protect it, love it better than she, share it in the light. And uh, uh, this poem, poem next I'll read is called Woven Mandala. And uh, a mandala is um, it's a blueprint of the universe. There are four gates um, to enter the mandala and, uh, and kindness, compassion, sympathy, and patience. And uh, in this woven mandala, um, one is always slipping through and out of the gates as maybe it's hard to stay put with such such uh, challenges and struggles. So um, this is gate, gate one. When she died, she expected she'd be in an unknown location. How surprised she was to be in Flushing, Queens. How surprised to be in a cave in Crete. How surprising to be in the subway and with a large seeing eye dog. So surprised to be asleep on stage with a dead audience, to be in an Alice Knockley poem. Skywalker, sky dancer, the one who moves space, the one who protects roots. Slip off the edge of the shore, off the edge land slip through permeable skin into sleep and out the other breath. The way one might slip into another's life, the way one is pulled by a slipstream, the way one slips into a rip, detrital matter, strialing as the shards of cast off shells. The way one might slip into a silk slip into an equatorial ocean, into an aquarium or quantum poetry that acts as an electromagnetic taser. In the arms of so much density, she's always in a state of slipping, shipping away. Onto the island with glass woods thick foliage chiming the wind. Without Einstein's theory of gravity, there is not much to hold her to earth. How long might she remain here, relatively that is? How surprising to be in Flushing Queens atop the Himalayas, thrown into a sweet sky burial, dancing beside a blue rat on a red lotus. Gate two, edges of meadows, swamplands, shores, and luminarias, limnal leaves, some island in the middle of the night, plangent beach with rolling, moaning, haunting waves, spelling something out, spilling it. It's trying to reach you through entrancing spells, through entrances. Night sky shaking with stars, shaking its starry fist. How images are hung in the galaxy so viewers can't come too close. Look around the gallery, gaze into the mirror's blaze. Cassiopeia haunts the celestial dance pole. Puss laps at the frozen Milky Way soft serve, the wizard's mind as a dolphin, to break or fragment, to fly, to die, flee. Sirius, nocturnal rose, hear its archipelago call, 
those who gather around it contain many islands and stretches of sea. The lost island buoyed by a moon's tide by the dream of escaping selves and elves and slaves. When one wishes on a flower, on a flame, on a candle, dripping lace on an iced cupcake, when one wishes into the fresh water of a fountain, copper with koi and pennies, the full moon dips in, ripples a puddle. In the six directions, the four winds, five elements, parallax planes emerge parallel plans converge. Gate three. One may catch feline ennui from sleek scarves worn too tight around the jugular. One may catch cloudy when one feels put upon by the whims of wind. One may catch loose leaf one may catch one's death. One needs to know one's location each light second so one can cast a heart line at any moment, a way out of the weave, a way home. If one is allotted one phone call, if one racks one's brains for the right number, the combination, a connection, as a way of escape, one might evolve into a nightingale's lament, a honey bear's overwinter, the hummingbird's torpor. A dyslexic can easily fall through the cracks, arrive in the china of pre-memory. If she is female, she was born with a pop-up book, instructions on the label written in Chinese, French, English, and glass. Each Argo must be precisely followed through the woods. A herd of humans, a herd of hands, they heard and gathered. When one falls through the cracks and arrives in India, if you see your waking face as you're walking your face, read the label and take as directed. Don't enter an out of order language or hum an adverse verse. Gate four. The way one slips out of one's body, slips into ether, merges with ocean, air. A floating container wisdom is, contains her a floating world. An eye floater, eye opener, an opening onto an avowal. When I falls asleep and tumbles into she. Remember the question is returned to sender if not claimed. Tending wayfarers and foxes, tending earth and Mars. Remember the question is derived from to seek. If one loses one's narrative thread, one is revolving without gravity. If one loses time, one loses self. Now that we selfie ourselves, the emergencies ensue, the emergence, see? Remember the question is relative and subjective. Remember a question is interactional, relational. We sail a broken ship through water of glass, awaken eight hours later, cut and forgotten, floating off, slipping. Slivers of dew, blades of glass, shards of star. When under the heavy body of dream, serpentine time might immobilize us with venom, spit us through the trap door, we're out, run, where there's no time signal, dial tone, slide, safe, free. And um, 
and then I'm going to end with a new a new work that I've been that I've started, and it's I'm in the process of it. It's going to be, I believe, a long poem, but I'm not quite what, sure what long means yet. Uh, the poem um, is investigates immigration and migration and transformation, and it also is located in a certain place. Um, and I'll just, the only other thing I'll say is I have another German word in this poem, and the word is Tom, um, which means dream, uh, and it's spelled T R A U M. Uh, and so, um, okay. Uh, so I'll call this On Migration. It doesn't quite have a title yet, but that'll be its working title. And this is a section from it. Even light migrates, its speed consistent, whether stationary or moving. Light unseen, bubblegum light, catching light, playing catch with lamb storm light during spring showers when snowdrops bloom, changeable luster with undulating light, light sleep, spectacular reflections on a fraying expanse, an exposure of light shifting across the shaman's owl eyes. Sky god Jupiter's century old storm drags on, lightning shatters black holes, towing time in its wake. Sky lanterns appearing as candles through lace cloud, thick and waxy, melted on the moon, light revealing ocean tears earth into billions of briny seeds, seeds of time, sands of time, revealing the traveler whose mansion is hefted on his back, walking yellow earth with lifetimes of rooms, life, lifeline bearer, bringer, Tom, a German dream. To stare at distance, starry-eyed into the lulling interval, scrying several pasts embraced in the dance of an owl. Her forward-facing eyes and horns bring to light that owls are not birds, but pallbearers silently hovering above our fear, basking in the emanated glow. The eyes permit death perception as a depth they rise through darkness to claim the hermetic sight. Hypnos flaps his owl wings, feathering rings to release the drape of sleep, Minerva, daughter of Jupiter. She unfolds before us, dressed as hue and shade, the shape of sleep, owl light shadows on the nightlight by the pallet. Moon rail traversed along the monorail Tom was like a tram ride through a mouth stream, was like, was like a circulatory system with verbal arteries, area lines to conduct electrical connectivity as dreams are funnels for oceanic insights in weak signaled seas, as dreams are funerals, guardrails, the pause between tender a fool to be. How far can the dream migrate? How far the light flies, the white owl in a salty dram. Adult dragonflies can migrate 2,200 miles, unite terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, 3.5 trillion insects redistribute energies from on high to the human eye, hitchhiking on global wind currents to see light unseen. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Martine. Beautiful. That was that was beautiful and wonderful and kind of swirling to include so much, which is it is a good segue for my introduction to Beverly Dolan. Um, so Beverly Dolan will read next. Beverly, uh, to me, is an integral 
part, I was going to say a line, but it might be a corridor because it's wider of American poetry, which in some ways goes back to the transcendentalists and, and Emily Dickinson, but certainly through um, HD and Robert Duncan and Barbara Guest, and through some of those reaches out to include certain European thinking, although now it's global thinking about psychology and the intersections of things both in the mind and in poetic texts. I wanted to read just a little bit from uh, the beginning of Beverly Dolan's reading, just a few, uh, uh, um, I would say lines, but it's not really in lines. And that is before that and before that, everything in a line, where it was broken into the house. I think that's an important concept, the house, uh, because it is a holding which holds more than it can possibly hold. The last work that I was part of publishing by Beverly Dolan, but there will be more, um, in the very first sort of unit of it, it mentions the book nests in your pocket hand, vests interest in the larger structure, the complex merger. And I think of Beverly's work as having this complex merger, which has widened that strain of American poetry to include so much, so much that uh, is so uh, needed in our time when sometimes things seem so dispersed and yet in Beverly's work I find even in dispersal the possibilities can be luminous and that, and that gives me something marvelous to take away from her work. I was uh, just several days ago listening to a panel of British commentators um, which included jazz musicians and critics on a 1972 uh, work by Miles Davis called On the Corner, in which they talked about the musicians each so much doing their own thing, but in the context of the whole, it did, does all come together, not in a way that maybe is, you know, the laces are all tied, but in a way that it all works together. And I think this is how I approach the work of Beverly Dolan as uh, a work in which many things happen at the same time as they do in the mind, and yet which, again, can, can both be all together and illuminating. And so without saying anything more, I just want to welcome Beverly Dolan. And I, Bev, Bev will, I, you have to unmute yourself. Let me make sure you can do that. Okay, I might have to find you. There she is. Okay. I have to ask you to unmute, and then Vic will have to click on something to for you to actually unmute. Mm -hmm. I still can't quite hear you yet. Let me see if I can just uh, somehow unmute. Okay. There you go. Now okay. it's Are we on? Yes. Are we yes. on now? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, all right, I'm just going to read um, a few poems. Um, moonlight to, excuse me. Well, moonlight the camera to just the rest, huh? 
uh, you're, you're, you're at the top of the screen. That would be fine, just like it is there. No, nope, now it's not. Yeah, raise the camera. Raise the camera or raise the screen. There. Perfect. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. Okay, are we on? Yes. Okay, all right, yes. now we go. Moonlight to bereft to infinity in a moment, to name it, to leave it, break. Words for loss, looking for meaning in the break. Nothing to do with words, conscious of what, break. Wind in pine chimes, play behind me. Not this, not now, break. Nothing in the break. Dark buildings at night, the grid of lights, the blue of moonlight on the sill at five o'clock in the morning. Cricket pulse, rocking the house that night, that summer, long ago, that heat, that long vista towards China rising in the west. Then the darkness between us, stripes of clouds across the afternoon. Nothing repeats again and again. Blank morning light is there. Figures of, puffy, figures of trees, puffy sky, repeating slight buildings in the distance. And finally, the pearly blue of heaven on the horizon, almost to see through it to another life. If you were going there, listening at night to the music, isn't that beautiful, he said. Of, three, of these three poems untitled, beginning with Eggleston's reply to his unseen interlocutor, it, quote, it, the photograph, has nothing to do with words, unquote. One might have argued that poetry also had nothing to do with words, and so writing would come to mark the silence of that other world, which is, of course, the world of the dead. Words speak to the living, but the dead cannot hear them. And so the first of these poems, unnamed, who can name the place of the dead, ritualizes denial and refuses to name the dead father, the literal place of summer childhood memory is replaced by winter night cold and rain, the scattering of ashes, the scattering of light and upwelling of darkness, memories recur and just quickly disappear. Something, thought, perception, is replaced by another thing in a parody of the blasphemous world, the present world, which is all an absence, unless it is a fact of sublime beauty and great persistence. It is Eggleston who says, isn't that beautiful, listening to the recording of Roy Orbison singing in the real world. And as a note, um, to uh, the book uh, on William Eggleston by, by uh, Michael Almirega, Eggleston in the real, William Eggleston in the real world. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Phantom reflect, excuse me, phantom reflections impose the light of another world through the glass so that now we see as if we were children, the tiniest ornaments and gilded twigs, gilded twigs, the icons of memory darkly the spattered stars, skies figures, always the icy window of a grand hotel, elegant white pillar always to the left, one reads the vision as if entering there from the pillar to the window, to the opening onto the sky, the vast plains of the sky swept by the wings of angels. And yet they're bounded and stranded in a space utterly small so the child is diminished, after all, leaving the theater orphaned to the present, casting, cast onto the street, the wet pavement blinking back, the sinister reflections of passing traffic and the sky oppressing void. <clears throat> a close brush, the light not yet formalized in the early pine, the light lowering cuts under face, eyes intense, shadows walking on Mission Street, gut level noise not heard so much as run over crushed stones into the parking lot, then wailing loss while shopping for some thing one knows not who or what this is, having been dropped here by the millions. What is this thing degraded out of all recognition, unknown? It, it can't be something anyone would think to build. For what reason, what use? And all the time, the wind is blowing the clouds, accumulating, stacked up on shelves, marked down the leftovers in a basket beside the door, coming and going. It sees you through unseen behind the curtain where we dined last night by the fires of the freeway, guests huddled under the bridge, warmed by candles and apples, opening towards winter again, a hummingbird suddenly winding up the chilly air. Thoughtless as shadow, the ground of shadow, one wouldn't, would one want all wants. And then what? The light across the lake and the eye creates space. The distance, which is not one, not only that, but all one wants. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for being here and giving. Us okay, I'm going to, um, you know, basically you can unmute yourselves now and we can uh, have a conversation or you can ask a question. I'll also turn the chat back on. And if anyone wants to put a question there, I'll try to see it but it's also fine to like to raise your hand or something and 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 just uh put a question forth 
and we can be here for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, yes, Stephen Vincent. Beverly, I've been listening to you for almost 50 years and you keep getting better. <laughs> You don't have to blush. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I can't see everyone here. I'm so sorry about my reading. Okay. I'm just sorry about my reading because I've, I've had some dental mm -hmm. trouble and so it's a little fuzzy. Sorry about that. <clears throat> you can just have a thumb. Kenny, did you just have a thumb up, or did you want to ask a question? Well, but, but so I don't know. I don't have a question. I, I guess, but just to kind of such so, so beautiful, beautiful readings, and uh, such a sense of the of the dream of of everything. And and Martine's work to me seems like this really beautiful elaboration, with the the phonemes being dreamed or doing the dreaming. And just to sort of echo what what Stephen said, it's just Beverly. The the work seems so so distilled. I don't, you know, it it does. It's about whatever it's about, and it touches so many things. But each thing is just, um, I don't know. It's held in this really distilled gaze, and um, I don't know. Every, everything's uh, eternity is just shimmering right, right in everything. You know, thank you so much. So beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I should add. By the way, we're talking about the work of. Um, Robert Cornell there, you know, the, the, the artist with the, you know, the, the works in the, in the uh, box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Joseph Cornell? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joseph, yeah, well, yeah, Joseph. <clears throat> Yeah, those to me again uh, what I was saying in your introduction you know maybe containers in a way but that propose so much that goes beyond even the possibility of being contained say that again <laughs> I didn't hear you there are some small works like those very contained works of Joseph Cornell that seem to that seem to propose something much larger in consciousness or something that that even is would be impossible to be contained. Mm -hmm. I Seems thought, like, well, go ahead, Martine. I was just yeah. going to say when, when you look at Cornell's work, uh, there's um, not you know not obviously a Cornell scholar, but there's the their birds or the dancers or the those uh, the objects in the cages or in the containers that are fly are always there's always a conflict of them wanting to like burst out so you have that kind of conflict and uh, and yeah Bev your work uh, your language definitely I felt that the the container and the bursting out of the container. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we could say the same about yours, Martine. And it's really good to see you again after all these years. And uh, yeah, your, your figure of the theater and of the and of the Mandela, the the enclosure and all that's happening in the enclosure. But it's always producing light and it's always reflecting of things outside. You know, that's a really neat figure all the way through. It's nice when the two readers somehow without any planning have a similar space or geometry. And that happens a lot in these readings and it's lovely to see. Yes, they are both such beautiful readings and it's amazing how they resonated and wove into each other's kind of uh, nocturnal musics and layers these from Martine, from all the slippage and the dissonance, the dislocation that you employ, it's 
so inquisitive and it's so incisive and yet there's something incredibly lulling and oneric about it and the way that the following lines of Beverly's came in afterwards with uh, lines like nothing in the break and the stripes of clouds, the cricket pulsing. I mean, there's just this incredible, um, these constructions that came to mind that are so haunting. They just feel like I just came out of like <laughs> 10 hours of dreaming and they're both such beautiful readings. Yeah, can't wait to read your new book to Martine and it was wonderful to hear you Bev, you were, you, there is so much in there. Discrete displacements, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Johanna, did Please. I see your hand go by a little while ago? Did you want to say something? Maybe not. Okay. Um, I wonder, uh, Beth, uh, in terms of that, the the dream. If you sometimes think of the long work a reading as, in part. Uh, a reading of the dream or a reading of a consciousness. Uh, yeah. What, what about it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'm ready to answer. You know, this, <laughs> yeah, where are we going with this? Yeah. Never... this the, 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 the poetry I just read is not from a reading. Yes, yes. This I is, these are separate. Yes from that, yeah. So, but a reading goes on. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, the a reading, the, the volumes of it in print so far and what may not have seen print before yet, uh, we're working on for a book at Chax Press that we hope to have ready to proofread soon and ready to be in the public eye in, in a few months, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just wanted to say to Beverly that I've been a fan of your work for years, and I had never heard you read before, and it was well worth hearing. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, there, there are recordings on um, what is that channel? Pen. Uh, pen something recordings. Was that the pen sound? Um, right. Yeah. yeah. There. Yeah. I I'm, like, I'm, I, I'm. I'm really sorry that um, I can't read more um, distinctly tonight because of this dental problem I'm having. But um, thank you all. Wonderful. Back to Johanna, were you waiting to say something, Johanna? Skipsrid? You're muted. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. I think this is a, this is sort of related to um, the topic of dreaming, but uh, we in, uh, over here were really delighted um, in uh, Martine's poem to um, encounter Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, I um, just wondered if um, she might talk a little bit, and really, I think it's for both because I think it does expand to the this you know observation about the dream, but um, about the role of fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Would you want to answer first? Yes, please. Uh, could you, you know, could you repeat? I can't hear. <laughs> can't um, hear you. Could somebody else repeat if I, if you're having, if you're having trouble hearing me? It's just a question, and uh, you know, it, it really is mostly for Martine, I guess. Um, but it, it could, it, yeah, it's a, it's a general question too about the role of fairy tales, the relationship between oh, fairy tales. You know, yeah. Um, they she's, she's asking Martine. 
Oh, she's asking my team. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I think no, both we both answer. Would you like to answer first? Uh, yeah. No, my uh, my team. You answer your. Okay, your I'll, I'll answer. Okay, I'll fairy go. Tale. Um, yeah, fairy uh, fairy tales play a very uh, central role in in many of my poems, and perhaps behind the behind some of the poems where they don't uh, appear in um, direct, in, in direct ways. Uh, the, the secrets, the oral traditions, the secrets in fairy tales, um, the uh, collective unconscious, conscious, and um, the recognizable archetypes, um, uh, find and the language, the repetition, uh, the rhymes, the the yeah. ancient quality, the ancient in terms of my personal history. You know, I was I've recently um, my mother uh, recently has gotten sick, and so you know we've been talking a lot of a lot about you know when I was a child, and we've been reciting nursery rhymes and things like that. Um, so in my personal history, um, nursery rhymes are were very, uh, very um, important. And then when you go back to, to the history of everyone, these stories, they pass through orally and they're so ancient and they're part of dreams. When we dream, we dream, we all dream of teeth and we all dream of, you know, moons and we all dream of forests. And these are all us, the central settings and heart of fairy tales. So they, then they of course come out in poetry, which is so primal. Yeah. Yes, I, I too, I think, I think it, that we're very lucky if our mothers or fathers read to us when we're small children, because it, it, it helps us um, it helps us understand the world in a different light from what we may have thought of before. Um, that there is a world that is not the hard, cold reality of, of our everyday lives. There's a, there's a world of the imagination and that's what fairy tales having been read to us, helps us understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Who's speaking? What? Does, does someone want to say something and do you need to unmute yourself? Or, okay. I almost want to say about what you said, Beverly, so lucky to have mother or father who read to us, but it, at least in my family, I also want to say, read to us, sing to us, and dance with us when we are young. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we're ready to say good night. I want to thank everyone for being here. Repeat what uh, Tanya Nathanson said that our next event, our next event is not a Zoom event, but if you're in or near Tucson, uh, November 19th with Jonathan Stalling and Tony Luberman or on the um, web soon after that, this reading will also be uh, archived and available on our YouTube channel. Uh, however, don't expect it right away we, we we are missing some of our manpower from last year that tended to put up those videos like the next day and now we're struggling to put them up in a week or so <laughs> okay but uh thank you beverly thank you martine and thank you everyone thank you thank you very much thank you this is wonderful thank you, you. good night good night good night Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Martine. Bye-bye.
Beverly, thank you again. It was just wonderful to see you. Oh, and are, are these poems going to be oh, in a thank you. Yeah, will these poems be in a new book? Will these poems you Pardon read? Me? Will these poems be in a new book? That you read tonight? Um, the poems I read tonight, um, I don't think have ever been published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't, they haven't been published. Are there, are there plans for a new collection of unpublished poems? Not that I know of. <laughs> are you offering? Yeah. You know, yeah, we she know knows how press. slow I am, yeah. though. <laughs> we know a good press if you need a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. Also, <laughs> thank you, Stephen, yeah. for um, just being so supportive tonight and wanting it to happen so much. You helped, Stephen Vincent. <laughs> yeah. Great pleasure. Okay. Thanks. Steve. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Johanna, get to you. Okay. Okay. okay, good night, everybody. I'm going to end it. Good night, Charles. Good night, good night, good night, Charles. Good night, Cynthia. Good night.